Your safety, the safety of your fellow workers, and the safety of the driving public will depend on you performing your flagging duties properly. An effective flagging operation is not something that just happens. It's the result of planning, proper training, and the use of good flagging procedures. This program was developed to help prepare you to be a flagger. As a flagger, you're in contact with the public more than anyone else on the job. Your attitude and appearance directly affect the public's view of operations. A flagger's responsibilities are critical in keeping the work zone safe. Your first responsibility as a flagger is to have the proper clothing and equipment in good condition. Improper equipment reduces the driver's ability to understand your instructions. Neat dress and appearance also help you gain the driver's respect making your job that much easier. Your clothes shall include an orange safety vest, shirt or coat, and may include a brightly colored hat. This clothing makes you more visible to traffic and makes you stand out from the other workers. It is also a good idea to carry an air horn to alert your co-workers if a vehicle appears likely to run into the work area. The main traffic control device used by flaggers is the stop slow paddle. This sign is octagon shaped at least 18 by 18 inches with six inch high letters. The paddle should be mounted on a handle that measures at least five feet from the ground to the bottom of the sign. A six or seven foot mounting height will make the paddle more visible. Before beginning any flagging operation, Advanced warning signs must be in place. For most flagging operations, this will include a road work ahead sign, a one lane road ahead sign, and a flagger symbol sign. In some cases, other advanced warning signs may be used, but in all cases, the flagger sign must be in place before flagging begins. With advanced warning signs in place and with proper equipment, the flaggers may now begin controlling traffic. Because drivers are sometimes tired, preoccupied, or impaired, you must remain alert at all times and stay on your feet facing oncoming traffic. Always stand alone in a highly visible location away from other workers and work vehicles. However, never stand directly in the path of an approaching vehicle. Generally, flagging operations require three basic skills. Stopping, releasing, and slowing traffic. To stop traffic, stand on the shoulder of the roadway with the stop paddle away from your body on or near the edge of the pavement. Look directly at the approaching traffic. Raise your free hand with the palm exposed to the approaching driver. Make eye contact with the driver. After you have stopped the first vehicle, remain on the shoulder of the road. This is your normal flagging location. If additional vehicles arrive and they cannot clearly see your stop paddle, then you may walk out to the center of the roadway so the additional approaching traffic can see the stop paddle. Do not cross the center line. Remember to watch out for traffic that may be coming from behind you. Never stand in the path of oncoming traffic. Before you release traffic, you'll need to move back to your normal flagging location. Keep your paddle on stop until you are safely on the shoulder of the road. Only then may you release traffic. There are two ways to release traffic. The first way is from the closed lane. To release traffic from the closed lane, turn the slow side of the paddle to face the vehicles. With your free arm, signal the drivers to proceed into the open lane. Be direct and point in the direction you want the traffic to go. Never wave the paddle. After all the vehicles have passed, turn your paddle to stop 
and wait for the next vehicle. The second way to release traffic is from the open lane. After the road is clear ahead, display the slow paddle to the drivers. With your free arm, motion the drivers to proceed. Again, be direct and deliberate in your motions. In some cases, you may not need to stop traffic, but only slow it down. In these cases, always stand on the shoulder of the road. Display the slow paddle to oncoming traffic. Use your free arm to motion traffic to slow down. Remember, never stand in the path of oncoming traffic. If you learn these three basic skills, you'll be well prepared for any flagging operation. Situations will vary and how you apply these skills will differ from project to project. Remember, never start any flagging operation until advance warning signs are in place. These signs tell the driver that you're controlling traffic ahead. Without these advance warning signs, the driver does not expect you to be in the roadway. Now, let's look at some typical situations a flagger may face. The first situation is a single flagger operation. Sometimes only one flagger is needed to control traffic on a low volume two lane road. Where only one flagger is used, the work area must be short and on a straight section of roadway. The flagger must be visible to approaching traffic from both directions. In a single flagger operation, the flagger stands on the shoulder directly across from the work area so that he or she is visible to traffic approaching from either direction. Then the flagger can assign right of way with the paddle. Remember, a single flagger operation is only acceptable for low volume conditions where there is good sight distance from both approaches and the work area is short. The second situation, probably the most common, is the two flagger operation. When two flaggers are used, they must always be able to communicate with one another. This can be done by keeping visual contact, using radios, or using the flag carrying method. In these cases, one flagger is always in charge of the operation. If visual contact is possible in the work zone, then the operation normally works like this. One flagger displays the stop paddle and stops traffic while the second flagger displays the slow paddle and releases traffic. The first flagger continues to display the stop paddle and stop all traffic until the second flagger turns his paddle to stop and gives an all clear signal. This signal tells the second flagger he may release his traffic by displaying the slow paddle. The all clear message can be given visually by using a hand signal such as lifting one's hat be careful, however, not to use hand signals that may confuse the motorist. When visual contact is not possible, such as over hills or around curves, then radios are the best way to maintain communication between flaggers. If radios are not available, then the flag carrying method is another way to maintain communication between the flaggers. The first flagger hands a flag to the last car allowed to go through. When that driver reaches the second flagger, he hands him the flag. Having received the all clear, the second flagger can now allow traffic to flow safely in the opposite direction. This operation is very simple, but the flagger must be assured that the driver of the last vehicle will pass the flag to the other flagger. Remember, Communication between flaggers is vital, and radios are the best way to maintain communication. The third situation is use of a pilot car for traffic control. This method works best where the route is particularly long or dangerous, or where the work area changes so often that proper signing is difficult. The pilot car is used to guide a train of vehicles through the job or detour. This operation uses a flagger at each end of the one lane section. In this type of operation, the flaggers hold all traffic on each end of the work zone until the pilot car arrives and leads the traffic through the work zone. 
A safe turnaround location should be provided for the pilot car at each end of the work zone. Provision should also be made for identification of the last vehicle in the column. The vehicle selected for the pilot car should be lightweight and easy to handle. It should have the name of the agency or contractor clearly displayed. The pilot car sign shall be mounted on the rear of the vehicle. Two or more pilot cars may be used to guide traffic through a particularly complex or dangerous detour. The fourth situation is nighttime flagging operations. These procedures are generally the same as daytime, except for some equipment changes. A flashlight with glow cone is recommended, while a retro reflectorized vest and a retro reflectorized stop slow paddle are required for nighttime flagging operations. To stop an approaching vehicle, stand on the shoulder of the road holding the stop paddle away from your body. Do not stand in the travel lane. Wave your flashlight with glow cone back and forth in front of your body to attract the driver's attention. To release traffic, turn the paddle to slow and direct traffic to proceed by pointing the flashlight into the open lane. Do not wave the flashlight while releasing traffic. This might confuse the drivers. If possible, the flagging station should be lit by auxiliary lighting. This is the safest way to flag at night. The more visible you are, the easier it is for the driver to see you and to follow your instructions. The fifth situation involves only one flagger restricting only one direction of traffic. An example of this is an area where trucks are loading or unloading and are blocking a lane. The flagger stops traffic in the usual manner. Once the work has been completed and the way is clear, the flagger releases traffic. When releasing traffic on a two-lane highway, where traffic is stopped temporarily in only one lane, turn the paddle a quarter turn so that the word stop faces you. In this position, the sign is parallel to the shoulder of the road so that neither stop nor slow can be read by motorists approaching from either direction. The stop message then will not confuse the traffic moving in the opposite direction. The sixth and final situation deals with emergencies such as a broken utility line, an accident, or a washout. In these situations, the proper flagging equipment may not always be available. In that case, a 24 by 24 inch red flag may be used for flagging traffic. In emergencies, your first priority is to warn the public of the hazard. To stop traffic, stand on the shoulder of the road and extend the flag into the roadway. Raise your other hand to the stop position. To release traffic, drop the flag to your side and with your free hand, motion traffic to proceed. Do not use the flag to motion traffic through. This confuses the drivers. To alert and slow traffic, the flag should be waved from the ground to shoulder height. As soon as the proper equipment is available, the stop-slow paddles should be used. Now let's summarize the six flagging situations we've just discussed. Single flagger operation. This operation is acceptable for low volume conditions where there is good sight distance and the work area is short. Two flagger operation. This is the most common flagging procedure. A flagger works on each end of the work zone to control the movement of traffic through the work area. Good communication between flaggers is critical during this operation. Pilot car operation. This method is used when the work zone is particularly long, dangerous, or complicated. Nighttime flagging operation. This can be a dangerous operation because of poor visibility at night. In all nighttime flagging operations, all traffic control devices must be retro-reflectorized and, if possible, the flagging stations should be lighted. One flagger restricting one direction of traffic. 
This operation is normally used where one lane of traffic is periodically blocked. Emergency flagging. Under emergency situations, 24 by 24 inch red flags may be used to control traffic until stop slow paddles can be obtained. Remember, no matter what flagging procedure is used, always stay alert. Face oncoming traffic. Stand alone in a good visible location away from other workers and work vehicles. And never stand in the path of approaching vehicles. Your job as a flagger is one of the most important jobs in the work zone. Everyone, including the motorists, fellow workers, and you, will depend on your ability to properly follow these flagging procedures. If you ever have any questions about flagging operations, don't hesitate to ask your supervisor. The supervisor is an important part of a good flagging operation. As a supervisor, be sure that your flaggers understand their duties. Decide which situations require flagging. If it is needed, don't allow work to begin until the flagger or flaggers are in place. Select flaggers carefully. Alertness, good vision and hearing, courtesy, neat appearance, intelligence, and a sense of responsibility are required. Be sure your flaggers have the proper equipment and the flagger signs are in place before flagging begins. Schedule routine breaks for your flaggers. Drive through the work zone and observe the flagger's operation. Close calls or skidding mean that the flagger stations need to be moved or that other problems exist. Signs should not be left up after flagging is completed. Remove, fold over, or turn away the flagger and other inappropriate signs when flagging is no longer being performed. Do not mislead the public. For additional information, you may refer to the flagging handbook produced by the American Traffic Safety Services Association. This is a pocket-sized handbook which you may want to obtain for your flaggers. Flagging is one of the most important jobs in any construction, maintenance, or utility operation. It is also one of the most dangerous. However, with proper training, equipment, and procedures, flagging can be safe and effective. <laughs>